Welcome. Uh, my name is Mike Yelnoski. I'm uh, the dean uh, of the law school, and uh, it is with mixed emotions that uh, I welcome you here this morning. Um, this is sort of the first major event we've had uh, at the law school since the untimely passing of our uh, president, Don Farish. So there are still some uh, some heavy hearts uh, here, but. This event for me is, um, is very exciting um, because it kind of kicks off uh, the law school academic year in just a couple of weeks in this very room, uh, 160, 170 new uh, law students will be uh, given the oath of professionalism by Chief Justice uh, Sattel, um, who's not here, I, was, I just waved to where, <laughs> where he will be standing when he swears them in. Um, so I'm very, I'm very excited about that. As I say, this, this sort of kicks off our uh, academic year. This is also an exciting um, day for us because it's the first major event uh, that we've had uh, in uh, this uh, courtroom since it's been dedicated to uh, Judge Celia, whose portrait you, uh, you see behind me. Um, it's great to see so many alums uh, in the audience. Um, Always nice to uh, welcome you back and, and to see you doing such uh, great work. Um, two terrific alums will be uh, leading you uh, through the day, uh, and it's always a pleasure to get to see them and, and get to uh, hear them talk about um, this truly important um, uh, body of law. Um, it, this is also a time uh, when I can feel completely comfortable uh, that I will not be the only lawyer in the room without socks. Uh, I proudly put my socks aside this morning um, because I know I'm not going to get called out. Uh, and finally, uh, it, this is an opportunity for me uh, to, to welcome um, my good friend, the law school's good friend, the university's good friend, uh, Double Hawk. Uh, Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. This will be his last open government summit as uh, AG, and I, I want to congratulate him on uh, the great work uh, that he's done uh, in his almost uh, eight years in office, uh, and particularly the work that his office has done uh, around open meetings and open records. So with that, uh, I think I'm asking the AG uh, to take over the podium, and I turn you over to the very good folks at, uh, at the AG's office, and I hope you have a great day, and hope to see you all around. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, give my words, uh, Dean, if I can ask you to just step up for a minute. Number one, I want to thank you on behalf of the office and the almost 750, give or take, people who are here, plus all the folks live streaming, for hosting this uh, since 2000. This is our 20th Open Government Summit, and Roger Williams has hosted all but one of them. So uh, that's a testament to, to the commitment that you continue to, to this topic and, and to the citizens of the state. So on behalf of the office, I just want to thank you and just give you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks. So uh, the dean did mention President Farish, and um, his tenure and mine started almost simultaneous. And about two weeks before he passed away, I had actually said to my assistant, well, I need to get together with the president and we can kind of commiserate over our dual tracks, if you will. And um, sadly, that did not happen. So if I can just take a minute and ask that we just bow our heads in his memory. Um, Thank you. So I, I thank the dean, as, as always, and, and before I get into some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of this, I'm going to do my thank yous first, um, because clearly this does not happen um, even with just Mike and Lisa, who really, as you all know, and they're the ones I give the credit to for making these numbers just increase every year. Um, by the depth of their knowledge, the quality of their presentations, and 
Mike Field and Lisa Pinsano, every time I hear somebody mention anything about open records or what they do, they are just ranked right up there in the top as far as knowledge and information. So I want to personally thank them for all you've done during, during my eight years here. So thank you. And they will be the first to say it doesn't happen without the help of Karen Regaster and Rachel Hurd, uh, who are both in the office, and in this case this year, our three interns, Merritt Focarelli, Emily Corio, and Mitchell Ramick. Uh, they are all here. You met them as you checked in. And um, our interns, uh, which Roger Williams in the law school send many to us, we could not um, do a lot of what we do without their help and input, so we thank them for that. The other person I would like to bring up at this time is uh, Jay Rosenfield. Jay is from Clark Base, and he has been streaming this now. We're trying to debate it whether this is the seventh year or eighth year, but this is streamed live. And so, again, testament to the folks who are in attendance, 750 or so, but it's still streamed live, and you can get it on our website, and that doesn't happen without Jay and his volunteering to do this at no cost to the state or the university or anyone. So where, where is Jay? Where did he, come here, Jay, please. <laughs> Jay, and, and as a small token of appreciation, I just want to give you that and thank you. Thank you. So thank it's you. Been a pleasure. So this is, as I stated, our 20th summit. And uh, it began in 1999 under then Attorney General Sheldon Whitehouse, and uh, who had the vision to do it, and thankfully uh, all of his successes have had the, um, the, the good thoughts to keep it moving and growing. And uh, in that first one, there were only 150 folks who attended. So I think it shows the importance to Rhode Islanders uh, why we do this. I know it shows the importance to the cities and towns and attorneys and police departments and town clerks and all the folks who are here today and watching today um, knowing the importance of uh, open government and open records and APRA uh, to everyone in the state of Rhode Island it makes us a better state a few years ago in 2012 I believe it was we updated the legislation for that with the backing of the office to create the balancing test that so many advocates wanted and so we have really moved this forward, in my opinion, in the past few years. That doesn't mean we should stop moving it forward. We should, and decisions are part of that process, which is why you are all here today. You will hear about recent decisions from uh, both the Supreme Court and within the office itself. And it is a continuous process. And I do think that is why it's grown. I think that's why it's important. And I think it's important to reinforce that not just by being here, but in the jobs that we do, and trying to say, you know something? Boy, I really don't want that public, but it's better to be public than not public. It's better for people to find out openly and honestly about something good, bad, or indifferent. Um, because that way, anything can be addressed and be worked through. And I am a firm believer in that, that anything can be addressed and be worked through uh, and part of that is being open. So I thank you all. I thank you all um, for your support for this uh, on behalf of the, the staff who worked so hard to make it happen. And now um, what you really want, though, is to hear from them so you get your CLE and not from me. Do not deduct, deduct my time for your CLE. And I will tell the dean that if it keeps growing like this, no, I am not going to give you Google money to build a new building uh, to accommodate us, but we do thank you for doing so. So thank you, enjoy your morning. I just wanna add my thanks to, uh, to the deans, the law school, to Chelsea Horn, and obviously to the AG for the past eight years and all the support um, that you provided and all the guidance and direction uh, regarding access to public records and open meetings. Um, and you know, I also, both the, the AG and the Dean mentioned President Ferris. I just want to recognize President Ferris also. Um, it, he's really um, in this room with us heartfelt. And the, the word that's always come to mind 
with President Ferris for me has been he's a gentleman. Um, so you know, I appreciate the, the sentiments and I know that the law school and the university does also. Um, we've handed out a booklet today. We're, Lisa and I are going to be referencing that booklet. You know, our goal today is obviously to provide as much information as we can to you regarding the Open Meetings and the Public Records Act, but also recognizing that we're going to throw a lot of information at you today and we're going to try and highlight some of the more important things that we really think that you need to leave here with, um, some of the real basic principles. Um, starting with the Access to Public Records Act, uh, we start with really two threshold questions, whether the Access to Public Record Act even applies to you, whether an Access to Public Record Act request has to be fulfilled. And the first is, are you a public body? Has the request been made to an entity that is a public body? And the definition starts off very broadly. I think it's pretty self-evident that most of you know that you're parts of public bodies. It starts off as any executive, legislative, judicial, regulatory, or administrative body of the state or any political subdivision. But then we get into this part that's here, which says it also includes any other public or private agency, person, partnership, corporation, or business entity acting on behalf of and or in place of any public agency. Um, so just because a document is maintained by, let's say, a private person doesn't, or a private entity, doesn't mean by itself that it's not subject to the Access to Public Records Act. Um, most of the cases here are really the fact-specific type of situation where we try to determine whether or not an entity is subject to APRA or not. Um, and it does get very fact-specific. How is the entity created? Um, what's their authority? Um, some factors such as that. The Town of Exeter case is a little bit interesting, and we're going to talk about that case um, in conjunction with another case in a slide or two. Um, but that was a case where an APRA request was made to a member of the town council. It wasn't made to the town council, but made directly to the member. And we held in that case that the member of the public body itself was not a public body. The request should have been made to the public body. And we'll talk more about that in a moment, uh, and you'll see how that plays out. But that's the first thing. Is it made to a public body? Uh, we had a case a couple years ago that also really demonstrates this principle. Request was made to the City of Providence for records maintained by one of their outside legal counsel. Um, the legal counsel maintained these records in their private law office. They were never in the City of Providence um, offices. We held that even though they were maintained by a private person, subject to this clause up here, that they were subject to the Access to Public Records Act. Those records were maintained by a private person on behalf of or uh, in conjunction with uh, the City of Providence and their work. So just because the records are not physically within your four walls doesn't mean that they're not part of the Access to Public Records Act. This is probably one of the more important slides because I think it starts to really hone in on what the public record law is all about and it starts to get public bodies in trouble pretty quickly if they don't do um, what they're supposed to do uh, or interpret the request in the proper fashion. Uh, rhetorically, let me start to ask um, whether or not it matters who is making a public record request. When you get a public record request, does it matter what they're asking the records for? Your answers to those questions should be no. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter um, what they're asking for, the, rec the, the reason they're asking for the records. Um, and this starts to really develop a theme that we're going to see with the Access to Public Records Act. If something is a public record, it doesn't matter who's asking for it, it doesn't matter why they're asking for it, it's public to everybody. Okay? And we see that with the, Bri J, uh, the J. Brian Day case we had uh, last year. This was a case where J. Brian Day um, was a business entity, one of their motor vehicles was involved in a motor vehicle accident. They asked um, from the city of Pawtucket for the name and registration and address of the person who was involved in the motor vehicle accident because they wanted to serve process upon that, uh, upon that person. We held it was not a public record. Okay? J. Brian Day was adamant that they had a public interest in it, that they had a self-interest in it, but that wasn't the issue that was before us. Again, as I just asked rhetorically before, does it matter who's asking for the records? No, it doesn't. The inquiry isn't whether those were public records to J. Brian Day or whether they were important or whether J. Brian Day had a public interest in them. The question was whether there was a public interest to everybody for that name, the home address, uh, the registration number. Um, and when we looked at it from that point of view, uh, the, the question and the analysis certainly provides that answer. 
Um, no duty under the Access to Public Record Act to answer questions. You need to be really careful about this. Um, there are certainly some public record requests, or some correspondences, I should say, that are made to public bodies under the auspices of the Access to Public Records Act, but they're really not seeking records. They're asking questions. Um, some of them are surveys. That's not subject to the Access to Public Records Act. What's subject to the Access to Public Records Act are your records, requests for records. Now, you need to be a little bit careful because the Pearson case was a situation where um, the, uh, what was it, the Coventry Board of Canvassers received a request. It was sort of um, delivered or written as a request for answers to questions, but we determined that when you looked at the totality of the document, the questions could have been answered through providing documents. In that type of situation, we said there are no magic words to, to make an app or request. You don't have to say, or the citizen doesn't have to say, I hereby make an access to public record act request. If it's a situation where <coughs> arguably it was an in interrogatory, interrogatory form, but the answer can be provided through providing documents, the public body should provide the documents. And in Pearson, that didn't happen, um, so we said that that was a violation. And the other real important point is providing documents, not narrative summaries. And again, Access to Public Record Act concerns providing documents, not answers to questions, not narrative answers or, or written answers. Um, the best case that really exemplifies this uh, principle is a case that we had a couple years ago with the Department of Corrections. An inmate had requested from the department um, what the ending balance was in a certain account. And the Department of Corrections responded um, just in a narrative form providing the answer to that inmate's question. We said that that was a violation because even though the information was conveyed accurately, the inmate was, or any person for that matter, was entitled to what the actual documents were. Um, so if you're in a situation where, you know, you certainly can provide a narrative response, but you have to provide the documents if you have the documents. We have a lot of situations where a public body won't have the documents and they'll just provide a narrative response because they don't have the documents. That's okay, but make sure you're explaining we're not providing you documents because we don't have the documents, but here's the answer to your question. Okay. Um, the next two slides kind of run in tandem. Uh, we go back to the town of Exeter case. We've had situations before where public bodies will say, well, we have the document on hand, but we didn't create it. Somebody gave it to us. Somebody sent it in. Therefore, it's not subject to APRA. That's not correct. APRA concerns all documents that are maintained or kept on file by the public body. It doesn't matter if you created them. It doesn't matter if you acquired them. Okay? So having them in your possession brings them within the ambit of the Access to Public Records Act. And as we talked about a slide or two ago, even if they're not within your four walls, if they're maintained by a private entity working on your behalf or acting on your behalf, um, that may still subject them to, to access the Public Records Act. And um, every person who makes a request has the right to inspect or copy them, okay? If somebody just wants to inspect them and not copy them, they have that right under APRA. Uh, I think there are a lot of requests that are made or some requests that are made um, that's say, you know, I don't want to copy them because I don't want to pay for that charge. I just want to pay, uh, I just want to inspect them under the belief that there will be no charge. And there may very well be situations where that's accurate. And we'll talk about charges a little bit later. Um, but just because somebody's requesting to inspect the records doesn't by itself mean that there won't be a charge. There's, there's definitely certain situations where um, a document has to be reviewed, may have confidential or exempt information before that person uh, inspects it. Um, so an inspection by itself doesn't automatically um, eliminate the whole cost issue. And going back to uh, the town of Exeter and the Tiverton case that I, I had implied or referenced a little bit earlier, um, again, town of Exeter was a case where somebody was seeking documents maintained by a particular um, town council member the request was made to the town council member, not to the public body. We said the, the individual member was not a public body, therefore the request wasn't valid. Um, the town of Tiverton case was a situation where the request was made to the town council, again, looking for records maintained by, the, by that member. We said that that was a public record request and that the town had an affirmative duty to obtain those documents from the town council member, okay? Uh, the Tiverton case, the town council didn't have the documents. 
the, uh, the town council member had them in their possession, uh, presumably at home or whatever it may have been. Um, so there was, um, just because the town council didn't have those documents under the clause that I had showed earlier about extending the APRA to other entities acting on behalf of or in place of the public body, that subjected those documents. And then um, public record. <coughs> So what is a public record? What is subject to the Access to Public Records Act? It starts with what I think you all probably envision, paper documents, videos, audio recordings. It really has nothing to do with what the substance is because after listing a whole bunch of um, types of documents that are subject to the public record law, the Access to Public Record Act makes clear that it also extends to any other material regardless of the physical form or characteristic that's made or received um, uh, pursuant to ordinance or law in the official transaction of business. Um, so it can be anything. And the last clause uh, regarding made or received pursuant to law or ordinance was the subject of the Supreme Court opinion in Pontarelli which came down in January. Um, I don't think that Pontarelli is really too surprising but it does put a little bit of gloss on this. Um, Pontarelli had made a request to uh, the Department of Education for records relating to the private law practice of a ride employee. Okay, so maybe there were records relating to a ride employee's private law practice that were maintained within the four walls of ride. Maybe there weren't. Um, the opinion never really even makes clear whether or not there were or there weren't. But the Rhode Island Supreme Court says it doesn't even matter if ride maintained those documents or had those within the four walls because those private law records don't relate to uh, or were not made or received pursuant to law or ordinance or in connection with the transaction of the official business of ride. Uh, so just because the, those documents may, may, may be maintained doesn't mean that they're automatically public records. So that really starts the basis and the foundation for the Access to Public Records Act. Does it apply? When does it apply? Um, the rest of the access to public record presentation, Lisa and I are going to talk about how to determine whether or not something is a public record, and then there are certain procedural provisions um, that have to be complied with under the Access to Public Records Act. How do you determine whether or not something is a public record? Well, there's really two questions to that. Anybody who's been to these summits before has heard me go through the analysis. Uh, the two questions are, one, does it fall within one of the 27 exemptions? Okay, there's 27 exemptions in your booklet. Um, they begin on the bottom of page 8. It goes all the way through page 12. You may just want to take a look at it because this is part of what we want to make sure that you're able to leave with after today. Um, they're labeled A through AA. And those are the 27 exemptions. If a document falls within one of those 27 exemptions, it's exempt from disclosure. Okay, if it doesn't fall within one of those 27 exemptions, you go to the second uh, step, which is this balancing test. And we'll talk a lot about the balancing test in a little, in a little bit. Uh, but the balancing test is, does the public interest outweigh the, public, uh, the privacy interest, or does the privacy interest outweigh the privacy? Um, if the privacy interest outweighs the public interest, that document is exempt, even though it doesn't fall within one of the 27 exemptions. Um, or the portion of the document that implicates the privacy interest is exempt. And again, we'll go through that in more depth in a couple moments. Um, again, we've talked about this slide at other uh, open government summits. I think there's a little bit, what I like about this slide actually is that it talks about confidential documents, exempt documents, public documents, and it really lays out what the difference is. Just because a document is exempt doesn't mean it can't be given out by a public body. Okay? If it falls within the balancing test or one of the exceptions that I just talked about, it's exempt from disclosure. The public body doesn't have to give the document out, but it still can give the document out. Okay? It's exempt. If it's confidential, there are certain records that either state law recognizes or federal law recognizes to be confidential. Medical records are a great example. Those can't be given out by law. There's a penalty to give those out. In Rhode Island, 911 tapes. It's a criminal act to disclose a 911 tape in Rhode Island. Those can't be given out. There's no discretion whatsoever. Those are confidential. And then everything that's not either confidential or exempt falls within the public area. Those documents have to be given out. 
Okay, so you go from no discretion to discretion to, again, no discretion it must be given out. Um, and then the last thing before turning it over to Lisa, any reasonable part of a document must be given out. I, I guess to say it in a different way, if a document or if you're going to exempt a document under the Access to Public Records Act in total, in your denial letter, you must state that no reasonably segregable portion of the document can be given out. And I think that's a great, a great opportunity or a great point to kind of stop and think. Don't just mechanically write down there's no segregable portion of this document that can be provided. Think about it. It's that last chance to provide a reasonably segregable part of the document <coughs> if a reasonably segregable part of the document can be provided. And a big part of this is, um, you know, how general is the request? If somebody's looking for, and one of the better examples from a couple years ago was a request for accident reports made, by the state, uh, made to the state police. Somebody had requested a month's worth of accident reports. Uh, the state police exempted them all in total. Uh, what they should have done, and what we said they should have done, was redact the personally identifiable information, who was involved, the address, um, the registration numbers, but then provide all the non-identifiable information. That would have protected the privacy interest, but still pri provided information to the public. And you see the Harris case. That's really what uh, City of Providence did earlier this year. Um, there was a request made for the mayor's schedule. Uh, I think it was over a year's period of his schedule, or a year and a half, and the City of Providence went through every entry, entry by entry. They provided the entries that should have been provided, and then they redacted such things as people who the mayor had interviewed, um, but who had not been hired. Certainly they had a privacy interest. Certain meetings regarding attorney-client privilege and the subject matter of those meetings were redacted. That's the type of, literally, a line-by-line -line analysis that you do sometimes have to do with these types of situations. As Mike mentioned, there are 27 exemptions. We're going to discuss some of them, ones that we see in our office most often. Individually identifiable records are exempt only if the disclosure of which would constitute a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act. Now, notice the word clearly. It's not just an unwarranted invasion. It's a clearly unwarranted invasion. So it's a bit of a higher threshold. This is the second balancing test we see in the Act. You recall Mike talked about weighing the public interest against the privacy interest. So this is, a, here again, we see that a public body will need to weigh and balance that. Now, if you are a public employee, any document containing any or all of these 15 categories of documents are public. So they include such things as your gross salary, your employment contract, your city or town of residence. That's all public information. You see we put the asterisks there because these categories of documents also apply to contractors and subcontractors working on public works projects that are required to be listed as certified payroll. Exemption B exempts trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a person, firm, or corporation which is of a privileged or confidential nature. So these are proprietary documents. We had an interesting finding in Harris. There, the complainant requested deposition transcripts that were taken during a civil case. Now, these transcripts were not filed in any court. So we needed to decide whether unfiled deposition transcripts in a civil case were public records under the APRA. Now, we observed that if deposition transcripts were public records accessible through the APRA, then any person, including a party to litigation, could obtain such a transcript through the APRA rather than from the stenographer. So we concluded in this context, the unfiled transcripts represented financial or commercial information. And we had no doubt that the dissemination of deposition transcripts under the APRA with a maximum amount that you can charge is 15 cents per page would cause substantial harm to the competitive position of the stenographer. Also, the Rhode Island Supreme Court has previously observed that the APRA was not designed to provide an alternative method of discovery for litigants. 
Now, Exemption H exempts reports and statements of strategy or negotiation involving labor relations or collective bargaining. In the Lombardo case, the complainant requested all public documents concerning the master agreement between the town of Westerly and the International Brotherhood of Police Officers. The town exempted numerous documents under H. The complainant argued that since the negotiation process regarding the master agreement had terminated, all documents relating there to the negotiation process should be public. The complainant alleged this exemption only applies to current or ongoing negotiations or collective bargaining, but we found no such limitation under the Act. We reviewed a voluminous amount of documents in camera and determined that there were five documents totaling eight pages that our department did not agree fell within the purview of Exemption H because they simply could not be characterized as reports and statements of strategy or negotiation. We directed the town to release these documents within 10 business days and the town complied. There's a exemption in the Access to Public Record Act pertaining uh, solely to law enforcement records. Records maintained by law enforcement are exempt from public disclosure but only to the extent that they fall within one of these following six categories. When you see reasonably be expected to interfere with investigations or enforcement proceedings, deprive a person of a right to a fair trial, reasonably be expected to constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And you know, we've been talking about and referencing the balancing tests and you know, I want to keep you here, so again, we're going to talk about the balancing test in more detail in a little bit. Um, but this balancing test, I think, um, at least the case that's cited underneath by the Rhode Island Supreme Court from a couple years ago, examined this balancing test for the first time. And what the Supreme Court said, I think, has applicability not just to law enforcement, but to everybody. Um, again, Lisa and I have been talking about these balancing tests. Some of them are in the law enforcement context. Some of them are in other contexts. But what the Supreme Court said in the Providence Journal case is that when you have the balancing test, the public body can ask the person who's making the request to state what the public interest is in disclosure. So you're going to be left with this balancing of, of balancing the public interest, balancing the privacy interest. When you have to balance that, pro that public interest, we do it all the time. I would suggest that you do it. Um, ask them what the public in interest is in disclosure. Okay? That helps you do what your job needs to be done. It helps you do what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to balance. Ask them what the public interest is in balancing. Sometimes it may be self-evident to you, but there's a lot of situations where the person making the request may know something that you don't. Um, and at the very least, it creates a record if that decision, if your decision gets challenged later on. Um, so you may want to think about that. And then the other three exemptions, uh, disclose confidential sources, disclose techniques or law enforcement investigations or prosecutions, or endanger somebody's life or physical safety. Uh, law enforcement should take notice. There is no exemption here for an ongoing investigation. Okay? That doesn't mean that, there, that records relating to ongoing investigations are all the time public. Um, my guess is that pursuant to the first exemption, uh, a lot of those records are going to fall within the reasonably be expected to interfere with investigations of uh, criminal <coughs> enforcement or, or, um, or activity proceedings. But that's the exemption you should be citing, not some exemption for an ongoing investigation. There is nothing for an ongoing investigation. Um, notwithstanding what I've just talked about, records that relate to the management and direction of a law enforcement agency and records that reflect the initial arrest of an adult are public records, even if those are ongoing matters. So if somebody's arrested, if an adult is arrested, that initial face sheet and that initial narrative report, those are public records. Now there may be some material within those records that can be redacted, but by and large those are public records, have to be provided. Um, something else I was going to add and now it just slipped my mind. Um, but those are public records have to be provided. Um, when the arrest is of an adult, even though those are ongoing investigations. Um, adult arrest logs, so everything within the Access to Public Records Act has to be responded to within 10 business days, subject to a 20 business day extension. The one exception are arrest logs. 
Arrest logs, and we'll talk about what those are on the next slide, but arrest logs have to be made available within 48 hours of a request or 72 hours if the request is made, within, uh, was made on a weekend or a holiday. And this time frame only applies to requests made for arrest logs five days prior to the request. So if I go into a law enforcement um, uh, office, if I go into the Bristol Police Department, make a request for a week's worth of arrest logs, I have to um, be given days one through five, or the last five days, within 48 hour, 72 hour time frame. And then days six and seven, I still, are, I still get, those are still public records, but not subject to this 48 hour slash 72 hour time frame. That's subject to the 10 business days slash 20 business day extension time frame. And again, this just lays out exactly what is an arrest log. To the extent that these records are maintained um, and law enforcement has them, they have to be disclosed within the time frame that I've just talked about. And then incident reports. We talked about arrest reports and how those are public records and have to be provided. Incident reports are reports that don't generate an arrest. Okay? There's no um, probable cause for an arrest. We've said in those types of situations when a request is made, particularly when the request is made for a specific and an identifiable arrest, uh, arrestee, or let me back that up, made for a specific and an identifiable person, that there has not been an arrestee, there is a presumption that those records are exempt. Okay? That was the, the Conley case here, where um, it happened to be juvenile in this case, which kind of brings in a whole other layer, but even putting the whole juvenile situation to, to the side, um, there was an incident report relating to a specific and identifiable person. Uh, the request was made for that. There's a presumption that those records are exempt. Doesn't mean that they're always exempt. There certainly could be situations where that presumption is rebutted. Certainly can be situations where somebody requests multiple incident reports and identities can be redacted, um, such as we talked about earlier. Um, but in general, that's the, the general rule with respect to incident reports. Exemption J exempts any minutes of a meeting of a public body which are not required to be disclosed pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. So this refers to properly sealed executive session minutes and that your public body convened into executive session for a proper purpose. So if you forget to seal your minutes or you choose not to seal your minutes, they are subject to the APRA. And we have directed public bodies to release sealed executive session minutes because they did not convene into executive session for a proper purpose. In other words, if you are in executive session for an improper purpose, the matter should have been held in open session. In the Sinapi case, we issued a violation against the Warwick School Committee when it discussed a non-noticed item in executive session. More specifically, the school committee discussed a Rhode Island Department of Education, or RIDE, decision, and whether or not the school committee was going to appeal that decision. The school committee claimed that the appeal period was running and that they needed to make a decision as soon as possible, but it was unclear to our department why the school committee could not have scheduled a special meeting to discuss that decision and potential appeal. Exemption K exempts preliminary drafts, notes, impressions, memoranda, working papers, and work product. You see we've underlined this latter section as this language was added in last year's legislative session. And we had a couple of findings last year concerning this preliminary draft exception. In Vitkevich versus Department of Transportation, the complainant was seeking documents related to those blue roadworks signs that are at different locations throughout the state, which indicate whether a roadworks project is on time and on budget. He was seeking, among other things, the cost of the signage design, construction, and installation. RIDOT acknowledged that it had one responsive document, but contended it was exempt under K because it was a preliminary draft. RIDOT represented that the withheld document represented a running tally of the signage already installed, and it had not yet been finalized. We noted that the word draft was appended to the document, although we have held consistent with the Rhode Island Supreme Court, that affixing the word draft to a document does not make it dispositive. We look to the substance, not the labels. 
And we concluded that Rideout's interpretation that the running tally of signage costs could be withheld indefinitely. So our review made clear that the withheld document represented a snapshot in time and indicated certain costs at that moment in time. The fact that additional future costs may be incurred does not make that document a draft. And we directed the Rideout to disclose the document. In Hartley, the complainant requested a copy of an audio recording from one of Coventry Fire District's open meetings. The fire district denied the request, indicating that the clerk keeps a tape recording of meetings as his notes or working papers to be used in preparing the formal minutes. So they alleged that the tape recording was a draft. Our department disagreed and concluded that since the audio recording was made in connection with the fire district meeting and was made to assist the clerk regarding the official minutes, this audio recording fell within the definition of a public record. Additionally, although the tape recording may be used as a mental aid for the clerk, it contained no mental impressions. The audio recording provided a verbatim accounting of a recorded event, so we directed the fire district to disclose that audio tape. However, if any of those categories of documents, the preliminary drafts, notes, impressions, are submitted at a public meeting, then they do become public documents. Continuing with a few more exceptions, uh, Exemption M exempts correspondence of and to elected officials with or relating to those they represent and correspondence of and to elected officials in their official capacity. Exemption P exempts all investigatory records of public bodies <coughs> pertaining to possible violations of statute, rule, or regulation other than final action taken. Now, an example of this is our department receives APRA complaints and Open Meetings Act complaints. In our investigation, including the affidavits we receive, our legal research, our handwritten notes, are exempt as investigatory. But our ultimate findings are public. Same with our Consumer Protection Unit. They receive complaints from consumers regarding stores, products, services. Their investigation would be exempt, except if they took any action against the offending party. Now, Exemption S, this is the red light. This exempts records, reports, opinions, information, and statements that are required to be kept confidential by federal law, regulation, state law, or rule of court. So that's that third category of documents that must not be given out. We had a case a few years ago where we held that the state police uh, correctly withheld a document from disclosure because if they had disclosed that document, it would have violated the Homeland Security Act. So when you're doing your public records analysis, it's important not only to look at the 27 exemptions, but other state and federal court cases and statutes that will get mandated through the act. We issued a, a recent finding in PIVA versus the Department of Corrections. Here, an inmate wanted certain information contained on two correctional officers' employment applications. This inmate is serving a life sentence. So that implicated the so-called civil death statute, which states every person imprisoned in the adult correctional institutions for life with respect to all civil rights and relations of any nature whatsoever shall be deemed dead in all respects, as if his or her natural life had taken place at the time of the conviction. Prior to us issuing this finding, the Rhode Island Supreme Court issued uh, or examined this statute in Gallup versus the Adult Correctional Institution. In Gallup, the Supreme Court dismissed a lawsuit that alleged state law claims on the basis that Gallup had been sent sentenced to life in prison and therefore by operation of law was civilly dead. The Supreme Court affirmed, as such, 
we held that the civil death statute applied to Mr. Paiva because he was sentenced to life in prison. He no longer possessed most commonly recognized civil rights. And we had no trouble determining that in accordance with Gallup, his right to file an APRA complaint had been extinguished. Indeed, if our office had found his APRA complaint meritorious, the remedy would be to file a civil lawsuit in Superior Court on his behalf, a remedy that Gallup, Gallup uh, made clear was terminated. Exemption Z exempts any individually identifiable evaluations of public school employees made pursuant to state or federal law or regulation. And this, it, this was modified approximately two weeks ago in the General Assembly. Before it was just teachers, now it's all public school employees. So those are some of the 27 exemptions. Again, we kind of showed you where they are in the book. I think it was pages 8 through 12. To the extent that a document falls within one of those exceptions, it's exempt from public disclosure. Doesn't mean it can't be given out, just means it doesn't have to be given out. If it doesn't fall within one of those 27 exemptions, now we go to the balancing test. Does the privacy interest outweigh the public interest or vice versa? Um, the D.A.R.E. case was where um, the Supreme Court actually had established a balancing test prior to D.A.R.E., but they re-articulated it and reaffirmed it in D.A.R.E. The Harris case and the Gannon case, uh, let me just set out the facts of those two, and then we'll talk about, I guess you can rhetorically ask how you think we should come out, and then I'll tell you how we came out, and we can decide whether or not we got those right or, or wrong. Um, the, the Harris case was a situation where there was a surveillance videotape made of an assault on a person, and that videotape was played at a Providence hearing uh, in open session. So that was the facts of Harris. And Gannon was a situation where a request had been made for invoices with certain people's names on them. People whose names on them were redacted by the city of Providence, I'm, by, I'm sorry, by the city of Pawtucket. And uh, those were names of people who the city had hired as temporary employees. Uh, so those are the facts of Harris and Gannon. I keep referring to this balancing test, and you have to weigh the public interest, you have to weigh the privacy interest, but what exactly is the public interest, what exactly is the privacy interest that you're weighing? And this slide and the next slide articulate really what those two principles are. Um, the public interest was set forth by the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Reporters Committee. Um, this is the seminal freedom of information case by the U.S. Supreme Court. Some of you may be saying, well, I'm here for APRA, I'm not here for the Freedom of Information Act, um, which is the federal <coughs> version of the state access to public record act. But our Rhode Island, Rhode Island Supreme Court has said that our APRA is modeled after the Freedom of Information Act. So that's why we're referring to it. And in this case, uh, Reporters Committee, a uh, reporter had made a request for a BCI report or a, a um, a uh, criminal history report, the, the, the Supreme Court actually calls it a rap sheet, of a person's um, criminal history record, and that person had had some interactions with a congressman. And what the U.S. Supreme Court said was that rap sheet or that BCI report was exempt from disclosure. It wasn't a public, in, it wasn't a public record because there was no public interest, or at least the privacy interest outweighed the public interest. And the court focuses on what the public interest is. And, you know, I don't like reading too much from, from other opinions, but what the U.S. Supreme Court said really hones us in and should really hone you in on what your focus is when we talk about the public interest. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court said that the Freedom of Information Act, and obviously in our case, the Access to Public Record Act, focuses on the citizen's right to be informed about what their government is up to. Official information that sheds light on an agency's performance of its statutory duties fall squarely within that statutory purpose. That purpose, however, is not fostered by disclosure of information about private citizens that is accumulated in various governmental files, but that reveals little or nothing about an agency's own conduct. And then a couple paragraphs later, the US Supreme Court really hones in on this even more, and it says, conceivably, the rap sheet would provide details to include in a new story, but in itself, this is not the kind of public interest for which Congress enacted the Freedom of Information Act. In other words, although there is undoubtedly some public interest in anyone's criminal history, 
the, cent the, freedom of information, the Freedom of Information Act's central purpose is to ensure that government's activities be open to the sharp eye of public scrutiny, not that information about private citizens that happens to be in the warehouse of the government be so disclosed. So that's what our focus is on. How does this information that I'm being asked um, to disclose, how will that shed light on government operations, on our statutory duties? Not is it interesting, not will it, as the J. Brian Day case shows, not will it help that particular person, but how does this shed light on the public interest on how we operate as government? Um, so that's what the public interest is. Um, when we get to the privacy interest, I think that's a little bit more identifiable just upon all of our, um, all of our experiences. Um, where the document concerns a private citizen, the privacy interest is at its apex. And again, this is where that whole redaction and the whole reasonably segregable comes into play. If the document can be redacted, then it has to be, and you, you protect the privacy interest while at the same time providing the public with what the public is entitled to. Um, Favish is a case that really exemplifies this. It's probably a case that sadly most of us are probably still familiar with. Um, President Clinton's then legal counsel, Vince Foster, had committed suicide. Um, this was in the midst of Whitewater investigations. There was obviously an investigation into Mr. Foster's death. He was, at the time, legal counsel to the president. Um, and um, somebody who the court opinions um, identifies as a sometimes consi conspiracy theorist asked for death scene photographs that were taken of the scene. And the U.S. Supreme Court, consistent with everything we're talking about, said no, um, the privacy interest is really at its apex in this type of situation. Obviously, it was a situation where the documents could not have been redacted. They were concerning one person. Even if the reports or photographs could be redacted, you still know who the person is. Um, what's interesting about this case also is that at death, Mr. Foster, just like in Rhode Island, has no right to privacy. The court didn't focus on Mr. Foster's right to privacy. They, fo they focused on the survivor's right to privacy to um, not be uh, inundated with these types of images. And they still determined that that type of privacy interest was at its apex. Um, so going back to the question I posed a couple moments ago, the Harris case and the Gannon case. Uh, Harris, again, was the case where a videotape, a surveillance video of somebody being assaulted um, was recorded and played during an open session. We said that there was a significant privacy interest in that, and there was no, disclosing that image, disclosing those images of that video, didn't shed light on any government operations, at least on the evidence that we had. Um, so in that case, we said that that video was exempt from disclosure. Uh, the Gannon case, we said that the names had been improperly redacted. Um, there had been not just some accusations, but some evidence that had been, been put forth that we felt tipped the scale um, on the public interest side, um, to know who the city had hired, how much they had paid, and you know, quite frankly, when you talk about the privacy interest, even though there were names of, of private people who had been um, hired and are in these documents, the privacy interest, when you talk about somebody who's being hired by government and paid by government, at least in that context, is relatively minimal compared to some of these other types of privacy situations that we've seen. Um, so that's kind of the balancing test uh, again, weighing the public interest versus the privacy interest, and if you can redact or the document's reasonably segregable, then you have to do that. Now, a public body cannot require, as a condition of fulfilling an APRA request, that the person provide a reason for the request or provide personally identifiable information. So this means a person can make an anonymous APRA request. Now, every public body shall establish written procedures regarding access to their public records. You can have a procedure that requires your public records request be submitted in writing, but you cannot require a written request if the document is available pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act or if it's readily available or prepared for the public. In Oliver, versus the Rhode Island Commission on the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, the complainant alleged that the commission violated the APRA when it failed to respond to her APRA request. The evidence revealed that she emailed the commission's executive director. And we determined that the commission did not have any APRA procedures in place. 
So we treated the complainant's email to the executive director as a proper APA request. Because the commission did not respond in any capacity, we found a violation. And I think this highlights the fact that having an APRA policy or procedure in place benefits both the public and the public body. So when you go back to your agencies, you should double check your APRA procedures. Our department's APRA procedures are on page 41 of your book, so you should feel free to use it or parts of it. Now, your written procedures must include the identification of your public records officer or unit, how a citizen can make a request, and where the citizen can make that request. You can certainly have a public records request form, but a person requesting the records cannot be required to use your form as long as their request is readily identifiable as a public records request. A copy of your APRA procedures must be on your public body's website if your public body maintains one. And it must be otherwise readily available to the public. So when you get an access to public record, <coughs> bless you. When you get an access to public record request, don't just put it on the side of your desk and hope it works itself out. Um, it won't. <laughs> um, I have a whole pile on my desk of things that, have that, that go in that pile, but APRA requests are not one of them. Um, one of three things has to be done within 10 business days of receiving an APRA request. Either have to provide the documents within 10 business days, provide a denial within 10 business days, or extend the time to respond in writing within 10 business days for good cause. <laughs> one of those three things has to be done within, within 10 business days of your receipt. Uh, Mudge is a case where the town of North Kingston um, complied in part, but then never finished complying within the 10 business days. Um, we found that that violated the Access to Public Records Act. We actually filed a lawsuit on that behalf, it resulted in a monetary fine. Um, so this is one of the areas where it's just, you know, it's easy, to it's easy to comply. Just make sure you respond within those 10 business days. Um, the next couple slides for all three of those options, really talk about what has to be done or what can be done um, for all three of those. If you're gonna deny the records, uh, whether it's within 10 business days or otherwise, it has to be done in writing, okay? You may have procedures that allow for an oral APRA request. Uh, Lisa talked about that in limited situations where the documents are readily available or available under the Administrative Procedures Act, you can't require a written request. Even if you get an oral request for access to public records, you have to respond in writing. So every denial has to be in writing. You have to state the reasons for the denial. We talked about the balancing test. We talked about the exceptions. And indicate the procedure for filing an appeal, um, which is articulated in 38-2-8. Those procedures are to either file an appeal with the chief administrative officer of your public body. That's defined as the highest ranking member of that public body. File a complaint with the attorney general's office or file a lawsuit in Superior Court. And somebody doesn't have to exhaust their administrative remedies. They can, from your denial, go right to Superior Court. Um, we'll talk about, in a slide or two, about training, but the person who denies or provides, that, provides access has to be authorized uh, under the Access to Public Records Act. So make sure that person has done the training, has submitted their certification, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the procedures for, that have to be followed prior to providing the records, uh, I don't think there's anything too crazy here. Um, APRA used to say that you had to provide an estimate regardless of whether there was a request or not. That has since been amended. So upon request, you have to provide an estimate. Upon request, you have to provide a detailed itemization uh, of the charges. Um, the search retrieval has to be done within a reasonable period of time. And Although you certainly have the option to waive search and retrieval and photocopying costs, if a court orders you to do so, you have to do so. Uh, again, I don't think there's anything too shocking with that. And the procedure to extend time. Again, this has to be done in writing. And you have to state the need um, for, um, for the extension in writing. It has to be one of these three things. Uh, that are listed, the voluminous nature of the request, the number of requests that are pending, or the difficulty in searching for and retrieving documents. And the Greenbaum case is a situation where the City of Providence 
um, basically copied language from the statute to extend the time uh, in, type, in sort of a boilerplate um, language situation. We held that violates the Access to Public Records Act. The Access to Public Records says you can extend time for 20 business days, but it has to be specific to the request, no boilerplate requests. Um, so make sure that you know, it's, there's something that shows that it's specific to that particular request. Um, if the person who is authorized to do uh, to, to deny and grant access to records happens to be away on vacation or whatever it may be, their absence does not constitute good cause to extend the time um, for access, to extend the time to reply. Um, so if you're going to be away, particularly if you're going to be away for an extended period of time or there's illness, make sure you have somebody to cover that. Um, make sure it may be a really good idea to have somebody who's already, have multiple people who's already authorized um, to grant access and to deny access. A public body is permitted to charge for photocopies and also charge for the time spent searching and retrieving for those documents. However, the act is unambiguous with respect to what a public body can charge for those two things. A public body can charge 15 cents for every copy on common business size or legal size paper. A public body can charge $15 per hour for search and retrieval, with the first hour being free of charge. And a public body can charge no more than the actual reasonable costs for providing electronic records. Now, the time spent redacting a document may be added to your search and retrieval time. In the Harris case, Ms. Harris made an APRA request to the city for Mayor Allure's schedule for a certain time period, and the complainant thought that the prepayment estimate was excessive. But based on our review, the number of entries over a one and a half year period, the fact that the entries had to be reviewed for potential redactions, we concluded that the prepayment estimate was reasonable. But compare that to another Harris case we had the year before, it was the same, basically the same complaint, there, we thought that the prepayment estimate was a bit excessive, based on our in-camera review of the responsive documents. For purposes of calculating your search and retrieval time, multiple requests from the same person or entity during a 30-day time period shall be considered one request. So this just means that if you receive a request from John Doe on August 1st, and it takes you a half hour to complete, we know we can't charge because he gets the hour free. But if John Doe makes another request on August 2nd on a completely different matter, and it takes your public body a half an hour, now he's used his hour, such that if he makes a third APRA request, as long as it's in that 30-day period from his first request, the public body is allowed to accumulate the time spent on other requests. This applies to entities as well. If different people from the same entity are requesting information, the same rationale applies. Now, you must waive all fees if you fail to produce records in a timely manner. And then this can also come from our office. So when someone files a complaint, that's part of the remedy we can direct the public body to produce the records within 10 business days at no cost. Nothing prohibits a public body from seeking prepayment with respect to search and retrieval and copying costs. And a public body can toll the time to respond while it awaits prepayment. In the Lavalley case, the complaint alleged that the Commerce Corporation violated the act when its prepayment estimate was unreasonable. The department concluded that the corporation's response as well as the affidavit submitted by the corporation conclusively established that the prepayment fee charge complied with the act. The corporation estimated 16 hours to search and retrieve and an estimated four hours for redaction. At the option of the person making the request, the public body shall provide copies electronically, by facsimile, or by mail unless complying would be unduly burdensome 
due to the volume of records or the costs incurred. So, per go ahead. Go ahead. Do it? Sure. Um, persons are responsible for the cost of delivery, and you can also charge for uh, retrieving from storage if you are ch if your public body is charged a storage fee. One of the other provisions in the Access to Public Records Act, there's no requirement that you reorganize, compile, um, or uh, consolidate records that are not maintained by your public body, except if they're, they're in an electronic format, and doing so would be unduly burdensome. Okay? If they're in electronic format, and you can recompile them, reorganize, I mean, typically I think about a spreadsheet or something like that, um, and you wouldn't be unduly burdensome, then you have to reorganize them um, as they've been requested subject to the Access to Public Record Act. Otherwise, there's no requirement to do so. Um, the Warwick case here um, is an example. Um, arguably, this was a case where some records were requested that the fire department even should have maintained. Well, even if the public body should maintain them, should have them, if they don't, there's no requirement to go out, create them, reorganize them, um, or compile them. Um, you now, it may run into other situations, other laws, retention laws, they may or may not be applicable, but under the app, Access to Public Records Act, um, no requirement to do so, even if they should exist. Somebody who's made a request, they can choose what type of media they want the, the request to be fulfilled, as long as the public body can do so. Okay? There was a case we had a bunch of years ago where um, applications were submitted to, I think it was like the Energy Office, and the energy office received hard copy records and they received electronic records. The person wanted them in an electronic format. They have that option as long as it wouldn't be unduly burdensome um, and the agency is capable of doing so. And I alluded to the training earlier with respect to um, the good cause for your, your officer. Training has to be done annually. If you are going to deny or grant access to records, you have to receive training from this office or through this office by video. Uh, today counts obviously for that training. Um, the certificate for training is I think on page 45 of your book. You can fill that out. It still has to be signed by the chief administrative officer of your, of your body, um, but make sure you do that. That would be done. Training today counts for calendar year 2019. So you're submitting training for the following year. And then the last access to public records slide, um, if there's been a willful or knowing violation, it's subject to a $2,000 fine. A reckless violation is subject to a $1,000 fine. And injunctive relief and attorney's fees. Injunctive relief being a court order to provide those types of documents. And attorney's fees, um, you know, quite frankly, that can um, run the, the dollar amount up a lot higher than the, than the willful and knowing uh, type of violation. So with that, before everybody leaves and, and, and exits, let me just say probably the most important thing that I'll say right before the break. Um, there's obviously restrooms on this floor, but in the cafeteria, the, the bottom floor has restrooms also. Um, so please you know, take advantage of both. And uh, we'll take a 15 minute break and we'll resume at uh, 1030. All right, we're going to start up again. We'll start with the open meetings. A couple brief announcements just before we start with the open meetings. Uh, number one, at the end, if you're an attorney and you're here for CLE credits, and if you're an attorney, I'm sure you are here for CLE credits, um, please be sure to get your certificates outside um, at the registration desk afterwards. Uh, you should all have evaluation sheets also. Please fill them out. We do read them. We do follow them. Um, we have adjusted this program numerous times over the course of the, the 20 years we've been doing this. Um, so please let us know what we're doing well, what we're not doing well, what we can improve. Um, it, we would appreciate that. And then the last point, after we do the open meeting presentation, we're going to go right into the question and answer. Uh, obviously, if you're in this main room, uh, you can ask the questions live. If you're in one of the uh, overflow rooms, you can either come into, one of this, into the main room to ask a question, or there are forms at the front desk where you can write down your question and they will forward them to us 
and we will try to address them during this presentation, or during the Q&A uh, portion of the presentation. So with that, without further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Lisa, and we'll start with the open meetings. We start with the purpose of the Open Meetings Act, and it is essential that public business be performed in an open and public manner, and that citizens be advised of and aware of the performance of public officials and the deliberations and decisions that go into the making of public policy. So I think one of the things we find in this purpose is that it's not just final decisions that citizens are able to witness, but also how the public body came to those decisions, what deliberations were made, and what issues were considered. We had an interesting finding in Davis. There the city council held a meeting and the agenda item listed a number of resolutions that the council was going to vote on whether or not to refer these resolutions to the ordinance committee. Now one resolution that the complaint was interested in was entitled, No Guns in Schools. The city council voted to refer this resolution to the ordinance committee. The complainant then left the meeting. Later on in the meeting, the city council reintroduced this particular resolution and decided it should not be referred to the ordinance committee. And we found that that violated the act, concluding that a citizen who witnessed the conclusion of an agenda item and then observed the public body move on to the next agenda item should not have to stay for the entire meeting just in case a concluded agenda item reappears later in the meeting. So we did issue a violation in that case. Now the Open Meetings Act doesn't apply in every situation. In order for the act even to be implicated, three threshold elements must be met. A quorum of a public body must have a meeting. If one or more of those elements is missing, the act simply isn't triggered. And we'll go through each of the elements. Now, here we're going to look at what a public body is. And it's any department, agency, commission, committee, board, council, bureau, or authority, or any subdivision thereof, of state or municipal government. So it's fairly broad. It does include subgroups, subcommittees, working groups. It's very fact specific in determining whether or not an entity is a public body under the definition of both the APRA and the Open Meetings Act. In Esposito, the complaint alleged that the Situate Superintendent Search Subcommittee failed to post its agenda and meeting minutes. The school committee contended that the Open Meetings Act did not apply to the subcommittee. So accordingly, we focused on whether the subcommittee was a public body under the Act, Open Meetings Act. And the dispositive factor concerns the subcommittee's scope of delegated authority. The search committee screened all the applicants for the superintendent position, interviewed candidates, and eliminated from consideration various applicants. The search committee took action and was performing a task under the school committee's jurisdiction. And therefore, we concluded that the subcommittee was subject to the Open Meetings Act. Now, contrast that with the Pontarelli case, the Supreme Court case that we've been talking about. There, the Compensation Review Committee was created by RIDE. The Compensation Re Review Committee convened to review salary adjustments for RIDE employees. The committee was composed of six RIDE employees. Members, membership on the committee was not by appointment, it was just an additional task for people on the leadership team. The evidence further revealed that the committee was an informal, ad hoc working group with no legal status or authority. They did not have regular meetings, rather they just scheduled their meetings when a committee member requested one. So the committee was really formed to keep three ride division chiefs informed about compensation requests. So that was not subject to the Open Meetings Act. Similarly, in Salvador, 
The Cumberland Mayor's Advisory Council was not a public body. The town aptly noted that the Advisory Council shared numerous key features with the committee in Ponterelli. The Advisory Council was strictly informal and advisory. There was no requirement that the Advisory Council met. There was no set schedule and was only comprised of three town residents. Now a quorum. Unless otherwise defined, a quorum is a simple majority of its membership. So a quorum for a five-member board would be three. In the Furness case, Furness, the complaint alleged that a quorum of the situate town council, four out of seven, met and discussed a number of resolutions. We received affidavits from all four town council members indicating that they had no such discussions. And one town council member did admit that he posted some information about two upcoming resolutions on his Facebook page. But since no other town council members commented on his post and no discussion occurred, the act was not implicated because there was no quorum. There is this notion of a walking or a rolling quorum, and that occurs when there's a series of meetings, each less than a quorum, but collectively represent a quorum. So if a public body is comprised of five members, as I indicated, three would be a quorum. So if two people were to meet and discuss public business, the act isn't implicated because the element of quorum isn't triggered. But if one of those two individuals goes on to a third member of the public body, and discusses what the original two spoke about, then you're circumventing this rolling or this, the quorum requirement. We had a finding where we found a task group violated the act by engaging in a series of email communications that constituted a quorum. Now, this walking or rolling quorum can be created not only by members of the public body, but also through a conduit, a third party. For example, a school committee, or a school superintendent, rather, may speak to less than a quorum of the school committee, but then go on to meet other members of the school committee and discuss the content of his or her conversations. A mayor or a town manager may make the same mistake with a city or town council. So as Lisa's indicated, in order for the Open Meeting Act to apply, you have to have a quorum of a public body convened for a meeting. Lisa's already talked about the quorum element. She's already talked about the public body. The meeting element is what I want to focus us on right now because that's really, at least in, in my experience, some of the nub of the issues that we get into. Um, a meeting is defined as the convening of a public body to discuss and or act upon a matter that the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over. And the key to this element is having a collective discussion or taking collective action. So really the best way to, to kind of go through this is through some examples. Um, we've got a couple cases listed here. We'll go through some other examples. Um, the Paul case was a case where the Coventry Planning Commission uh, during a recess had a discussion among several members. Um, several members of the public came up to talk to the chairman, several members of the board were engaged in that discussion. It was during a recess. Um, it was not within the public purview, at least audibly, uh, from an audible standpoint. Um, we said that didn't violate the Open Meeting Act. The reason being because there wasn't a quorum. Um, there was a quorum at the meeting, but there was not a quorum of, that, of the membership uh, of the public body engaged in that discussion. So for that reason, Paul was not a violation. Um, the city of Newport case, um, this was a case where there was a resignation on the city council and the city council's procedures um, required that the city council um, appoint the vacant slot, appoint a, a, the, uh, fill the vacancy. Uh, the members of the Newport city council over the course of several weeks had numerous discussions. They had discussions regarding what the process was going to be to fill this vacancy. There were some discussions about who was going to fill that vacancy, who the preferred candidate was. 
we held that that violated the Open Meetings Act. And we literally started to attach and, and connect all of the different conversations. These occurred over the course of several weeks. Um, so the time period for this rolling or walking quorum can be at least for a couple weeks, but we were focused on whether there was a quorum through individual conversations of a particular subject matter. And we connected all of those dots and determined that there was. We held for that reason that there was a violation. Um, the Gladstone case, I'll, I'll skip for a second, but I'll actually put in uh, the Pearson case, which was a case involving the Coventry Board of Canvassers, where the Board of Canvassers convened to pull names out of a hat or um, whatever it might have been for determination of what the ballot order was going to be. Um, that was not published as an open meeting. We held that it violated the Open Meeting Act. There was a public body, there was a quorum of the public body, and they were taking collective action. Okay, it wasn't necessarily the, the conventional or the traditional type of action where there was a vote, but they were pulling names out and, and determining the ballot order. The public had a right to witness that. Uh, we have a case from many years ago where the public body was just paying bills. The public had a right to do that. There was some sort of action. So anytime you have a quorum of the public body collectively discussing something or taking action, either at one meeting or through a series of meetings, and that could be over the course of several weeks or even months, that implicates the Open Meeting Act. Um, we get a lot of questions about talking about what I just um, uh, talked about, but translating it into the media world or the electronic world. Um, Facebook, text messaging, um, take your pick on whatever other types of electronic communications are out there. All the rules that we just talked about apply for the same exact um, situation, regardless of whether or not it's in live conversation or an electronic conversation. Okay, so if you can't do something live one-on-one, -on -one, if we can't talk about it through a series of meetings, you can't talk about it through a series of electronic meetings or electronic communications. The one exception is what's up here, which is that you can use electronic communications, I shouldn't say the one exception, the first exception, um, is that you can talk about, um, through electronic communications, when to schedule a meeting. Okay, that's it. Not what's going to be discussed at the meeting, only the scheduling of that meeting. That can be done electronically. Um, the Warwick School Committee case um, is arguably, I'm not sure how best to describe it, arguably of another one of the exceptions. That was a case where the school committee was talking with its attorney outside the public purview following a Superior Court decision issued by then Justice Frank Williams, um, by Superior Court Justice Frank Williams, uh, we held that conversations with a public body amongst and between its attorney did not violate or implicate the Open Meeting Act. Now, we're very careful to say that these are communications from the public body to the attorney and from the attorney to the public body members, not amongst the public body members. Now, that may be exempt under a different exemption, um, but those don't fall within this attorney-client um, type of discussion that was the subject of Justice Williams' uh, decision. Um, the other exceptions for electronic communications, if you're on active military duty, you can participate by electronic means, or if you have a disability and you can't otherwise participate during the meeting, you can participate through electronic means. Um, if you fall in the latter category, the Governor's Commission on Disabilities has certain rules and procedures you have to follow. I think that there's a, a form that has to be also filled out. Uh, make sure you comply with that or, or at least know about that and, and research what has to be done because uh, there are certain things other than just saying you have a disability. And then listservs. Listservs um, we have held are not, do not violate the Open Meeting Act. A listserv is basically where information is just sent out to the public body. Let's say the town clerk or the town council president <coughs> just sends an email out to the entire body. Well, that, doesn't, that by itself does not violate the Open Meeting Act. Okay? Think about why. We'll talk about the analysis that we just went through. You've got a quorum. The email is being sent out to the entire public body. You, certainly, they're a public body. Um, but there's no meeting. Okay? There's no collective discussion of that topic. There's only one email going out to the entire public body. If members of the public body respond to that email, now you've got a collective discussion going on. Okay, so that first email doesn't violate it. 
The second email may very well violate the Open Meeting Act, so you need to be careful about that. And even if you're that person who's sending out that first email, um, you know, I've seen, lot, seen lots of situations where those emails say, don't respond, that will violate the Open Meetings Act. Um, just be aware that once you hit send, you lose control of that, and inadvertently it may lead to a violation. Um, let's see, the Keegan case um, was a situation where uh, there was a press release that was issued by the town. Not every action that's done by a town, I think those of you in town government certainly know this, is an action of the public body. Um, there was a complaint filed in that case that, the, that there was a press release that was issued and um, there was no meeting to authorize that press release being issued. Well, it wasn't the town council that was issuing um, the press release, it was the town manager um, or the town administrator that, um, that authorized that press release or issued that press release. Uh, dinner or social events, okay? Again, you've got a quorum, you're a public body, but are you talking about collectively some subject matter or taking action that you have subject matter, that you have supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power over? If you're all out to dinner and talking about some social events, the answer is no. If you're out to dinner and you're talking about town business, then the answer is yes, okay? Um, the other little wrinkle with this is you know, sometimes who is a public body gets a little bit confusing and what's a quorum of a public body. You may have a situation where you're on the town council. Let's say the town council has seven members, uh, four being a quorum, but you're also on the finance committee. And the finance committee has three members. And three members who are all part of the finance committee meet uh, to discuss finance matters. Well, obviously that's not a violation of the town council meeting. You don't have a quorum but you do have a, count, you ha, do have a quorum of the, finance, of the finance committee. So you do also have to be aware, not just of that parent body that you may be a, a member of, but the subdivisions and the subcommittees. So once the Open Meeting Act applies, once you meet those three threshold elements, the Open Meeting Act applies, all the provisions apply, and just like with the Access to Public Records Act, there's a presumption that your meetings have to be held in public. Okay? As a matter of fact, they can only be held in executive session for one of the 10 stated reasons. Okay? Other than those 10 stated reasons, your meetings have to be in open session. How do you get into executive session, otherwise known as closed session? You have to articulate an open call. Your open call has to be by a majority of the members present, okay? so they have to vote by a majority. You have to state in open session and record in your open session minutes the specific subsection that you're going into executive session pursuant to, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And you have to state a statement specifying the nature of the business that's gonna be discussed for each and every matter that's going to be discussed in executive session, and not discuss any other matter. Uh, the, the Sinapi case, for instance, that was a complaint that we had that uh, the school committee had discussed something in executive session improperly like we do with any type of allegation regarding the executive session, we obtained the executive session minutes from the school committee and we found that the allegation was not, um, did not hold up. It was not a meritorious allegation. But what also happened when we did our review of the executive session minutes is that we found that the school committee had discussed another matter <coughs> in the executive session that nobody knew about. It wasn't on the agenda. Um, wasn't in any minutes, there was no <coughs> amendment, there was just another discussion that just had happened, okay? That violated the Open Meeting Act. You can't discuss any other matter in executive session even if that matter would have been appropriate. So you need to articulate that open call for each and every matter that's gonna be discussed in executive session and you need to make clear if multiple items are gonna be discussed in executive session that you're s discussing multiple items in executive session and you articulate a um, an open call for each individual matter. Uh, the Roberts case was a case where there was just no, ex no open call. Um, the executive session was convened. It didn't appear that there was any, we couldn't art, um, find any reason that fell within any of the exemptions for the open session. That violated the Open Meetings Act. We made sure and we declared that, um, that those executive session minutes be declared to be public records. 
As Mike indicated, there are 10 exemptions that a public body may choose that are required to go into executive session. And those exemptions can be found on pages 31 and 32. Now, one reason a public body may, but it's not required to go into executive session, would be to discuss the job performance, character, or physical or mental health of a person or persons. But there are a couple of procedural requirements that must be met if a public body chooses this option. The person affected shall receive advanced written notice that the discussion about him or her may be held in open session. And the public body must state an open call and record in its open session minutes that that required notice was provided. In Avanzado, the town council's town search panel violated the act when discussions were not appropriate under A1. We reviewed their executive session minutes and we found that there was no discussion about the job performance, character, or physical or mental health of any of the town manager's applicants. Because we concluded that the executive session discussion was not appropriate, we required the release of the executive session minutes. Now, the invitation into executive session lies with the public body, not the individual seeking to attend. Another appropriate purpose for which executive session may be held is A2, sessions or work sessions pertaining to collective bargaining or litigation. For example, a city council may want to convene into executive session with the city's solicitor to discuss the fact that the city was being sued for, say, a slip and fall on city property. So the council would probably want to discuss legal strategy and possible settlement in closed session. And it's significant to note that this section does not limit discussions only where litigation has been initiated, but also where litigation is reasonably anticipated. A4, investigative proceedings regarding allegations of civil or criminal misconduct, certainly an appropriate reason to go into executive session. A5 is the acquisition or lease of real property for public purposes or disposition <coughs> of publicly held property wherein advanced pu public information would be detrimental to the public. And A8, School committee sessions to conduct student disciplinary hearings or to review other matters related to the privacy of students or their records. Provided that, like we saw under A1, the job performance, advanced written notice must be provided that the discussion may take place in open, and they must state in their open call and record in their open session minutes that that notice was provided. <laughs> So your executive session votes. Uh, not every exception allows you to vote in executive session. Um, if you actually look at the text of the very first exception as an example, or, or the eighth exception, it says you can go into executive session for any discussions related to the job performance, character, or physical or mental health. We've said um, repeatedly that we interpret that law strictly. Because it says you can only go into executive session for discussions, you're limited to only having discussions and not taking votes. So not every exception allows you to take votes under uh, in executive session. But if you are taking a vote, if, you, if there's an exception that allows you to take the vote and you have taken a vote, that vote has to be disclosed as soon as the open session is reconvened. Okay? The exception to that is if doing so would um, create some sort of uh, jeopardy to the strategy or negotiation that you had just discussed in executive session. If that's the case, the vote doesn't have to be disclosed upon a reconvening into open session, but we have stated that that vote does have to be uh, disclosed after the jeopardy dissipates. And as a matter of fact, there's an affirmative duty on the public body to disclose that vote as soon as the jeopardy dissipates. Uh, so be aware of that. Types of notice. There's two types of notices, annual notice and supplemental notice. Your annual notice is your regularly scheduled meetings. Okay, those are posted at the beginning of every calendar year, January of every calendar year. 
And those are all of your meetings that are regularly scheduled. If you meet on the first of every month, you're going to have a regular notice posted in January of your regular scheduled meetings. Supplemental notice is a minimum of 48 hours prior to the date of the meeting. It now excludes weekend and holiday hours. Okay? That was an amendment from about a year ago. Uh, where do those notices have to be posted? Three locations, or a minimum of three locations, the principal office of the public body holding the meeting, if there is no principal office at the location that the meeting is being held, one other prominent place within the governmental unit, and on the Secretary of State's website electronically. And I guess this is a good point to reemphasize that the Secretary of State's office, um, Stacey DeCola has a table outside to answer any questions um, today regarding posting to their website. Um, any types of um, those types of Secretary of State issues and posting requirement issues, um, the mechanics of it. They're happy to answer your questions outside. We had an advisory opinion we issued a couple weeks ago. Ironically, it came from the Secretary of State's office. Um, they used to post notice, and I guess they still do post some notices on the bulletin board outside at the State House. Um, the question we got was we now have an electronic kiosk at, uh, in the State House. Can that serve as the other location within the, within the governmental unit? We said yes. Uh, if you're posting on a bulletin board at the State House, there's really no reason why an electronic kiosk at the State House can't serve that same function. Um, so that's a service that's now available um, at the State House. What does notice have to include? What do your notices have to include? If we're talking about the annual notice, it has to include the date, time, and locations of the regularly scheduled meetings and it has to be provided to members of the public upon request. If we're talking about the supplemental notice, it has to include the date, time, location of the meeting, the date the notice was posted, and most importantly, uh, a statement specifying the nature of the business to be discussed. Um, Lisa had talked about the Ponterelli case. Uh, the emphasized language here about a statement specifying the nature of the business to be discussed, this has been a subject that we've talked about in the past. It's going to be a subject we talk about in the future. Uh, it's a subject that in the last decade or so, a little bit more than a decade, the Rhode Island Supreme Court has spoken about it three times through their opinions. Uh, that really started with Tanner in 2003. Tanner versus the town of East Greenwich. Uh, the town had posted notice for interviews of potential board and commission appointments. And what the town did is they uh, interviewed certain people According to the notice, at 10.15 they were going to interview somebody, at 10.30 they were going to notice some, uh, interview somebody, et cetera. And what the Rhode Island Supreme Court said was, that was fine. What violated the Open Meeting Act, however, was not only did you interview people and give notice that you were interviewing people, but then you went and made an appointment. And there was no notice on the agenda that you were also going to make the appointment. And the court said that uh, this statement specifying the nature of the business to be discussed requires public bodies to post fair notice to the public under the circumstances. I know not a lot of great hope for those of you who are there making the agenda, um, but that's what the court articulated, uh, and that's the standard. Uh, about a decade later, the court re-examined this statement uh, in Analog versus City of Newport. Uh, that was a case where, under the communication section of the agenda, uh, the City of Newport posted requests for extension regarding congregate regarding Congregation Jesuit Israel, and they posted uh, or indicated the attorney's name who was making the request. There was a construction project that was going on in town regarding the congregation, and there was an extension of when that project had to be substantially completed. Um, the trial justice said, nope, that notice, com that notice complies with the Open Meeting Act. That's fair notice under Tanner, no violation. It goes up to the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and the Rhode Island Supreme Court says, no, that's obviously a violation of the Open Meeting Act. Um, they say that the notice was completely silent as to what property was, was subject to this extension, where that property was located. Um, they took a special uh, exception to the fact that this notice was posted under the communication section of the agenda and didn't give any hint that any action was going to be taken uh, on this agenda item. So again, being more specific, and you see the court requiring more and more notice from Tanner to Analec, and you see that again, Lisa referenced Pontarelli from a, a couple years ago, even requiring more notice in the Pontarelli case. Uh, that was the case where uh, the council had posted on their agenda 
uh, that they were going to talk about the approval of RIDE's executive pay plan, and that it in, and it indicated there, there was an enclosure, enclosure 7B. Um, the Rhode Island Supreme Court, well, again, the trial justice said, nope, that complies with the Open Meetings Act, no Open Meeting Act violation, goes up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, no, there's an open meeting violation. They flip that. Um, the issue that the Supreme, the Supreme Court had a couple issues in, in this one. Um, the agenda said, and, and just listen very carefully to the singular, approval of RIDE's executive pay plan in the singular. Supreme Court said, no, you didn't talk about a plan in the singular, you talked about plans in the plural. That violated the Open Meetings Act, according to the court. Uh, the court says, the agenda says that you can also see Exhibit 7B, and Exhibit B, 7B may have given some indication that there were multiple plans that were going to be discussed, and not just one plan, but the exhibit never made its way onto the Secretary of State's website. Okay, so because of that absence, because of the singular, uh, the court says that violated the Open Meetings Act. What was also interesting about this is the court notes that the agenda and the exhibit were posted on RIDE's website. And the court says that doesn't matter. The Open Meeting Act doesn't require the notice to be on RIDE's website. It requires it to be on the Secretary of State's website. So the fact that the exhibit was posted on some other site didn't matter. It had to be on the Secretary of State's website. Uh, the lesson for all of us is be specific on your notices. Be as specific as you can. Um, if you get a complaint, or a, particularly if you're before the Rhode Island Supreme Court, what these trilogy of cases show is that you're going to be behind the eight ball. And we recognize that there are situations where either the discussion is going to veer in a different direction when you're at the meeting, or maybe such as the ride situation, uh, you realize you left off the yes or whatever it may be. We're going to talk about in a moment about amending the agenda. Most of your questions or most of your issues can be addressed through amending the agenda. It's different for school committees. Everybody else but school committees um, really can, make, can take advantage of, of or use uh, that provision. But just be aware about that, and I wanted to foreshadow that because that's a big issue uh, that's in the case law right now. Here are some examples of agenda items that are simply not specific enough. A citizen would not know if he or she wa wanted to attend a meeting when the agenda item is entitled, any other matter to be brought before the board. <laughs> An agenda item entitled, old business, would be appropriate if underneath that heading, there was listed the matter or matters which constituted the old business. <laughs> Uh, in the Caldwell McNamara finding, the East Greenwich Town Council's agenda item listed town manager's report. And that was simply insufficient, especially in light of the evidence revealed that the town council discussed a number of collective bargaining agreements. In Aviard Kitchen, the complainants alleged that the town council violated the act when it voted to terminate their respective employment positions <coughs> in executive session. Yet the agenda listed sessions pertaining to collective bargaining or litigation. Our in-camera review revealed that the discussion concerned the town restructuring plan that included layoffs of municipal employees. The town alleged this was proper for executive session since the town solicitor would advise the town council members of the legal implications in terminating town employees. And we concluded that after the town council discussed the litigation issues surrounding the termination, the discussion and or vote to implement its plan did not relate to litigation. So there was a violation in that case as well. Now your executive session notice Again, no boilerplate language like a placeholder. It has to be specific to each and every meeting. Identify each topic that you're gonna discuss under each exemption and include a statement of each item to be discussed. Now, if the matter is publicly known, you need to provide a detailed statement. If a lawsuit, say, was filed, we have findings that indicate you must state the case name, not just litigation. If the topic is not publicly known, 
a public body may use more general language. And we'll see that on the um, next slide where we give some examples of proper executive session. Notice number three, personnel matter under A1 and two. So we know it concerns the job performance, character, or mental health of an individual. And under A2, it's going to include uh, a potential litigation or collective bargaining matter. So they're going to discuss this personnel matter under both sections. They listed it. It's obviously not publicly known, so they're indicating they don't state the person's name. And number four, potential litigation. So the lawsuit has not yet been filed, but we at least know it involves a land dispute. Mike just mentioned amending agendas. That's what we're going to address now. And the next two slides do not apply to school committees. So a public body may amend its agenda by a majority vote to add additional items. However, these additional items shall be for informational purposes only and may not be voted upon, except where necessary to address an unexpected occurrence that requires immediate action to protect the public or to refer the matter to another appropriate committee or another body or official. So you may think your agenda is specific enough, but when you get to the meeting, discussions start to veer off in another direction or someone complains that the notice is not specific enough, what options do you have at that point? The act allows you to amend your agenda at the very meeting. In the Dion case, the subject agenda item stated, appointing John Ward as clerk and member of the Board of Canvases. At the meeting, the evidence revealed that a motion was made and seconded to amend the agenda. It appeared that the City Council intended to appoint Mr. Ward as a member of the board, but not the clerk. So the city council amended its agenda to add Suzanne Vadnais as the clerk of the board of canvases. It was amended and, and they voted on it, and that's where the violation occurred. It was for informational purposes only. So we found no willful or knowing violation, but we did direct the city council to reconsider and re-vote on that agenda item at a properly posted future meeting. Amending school committee's agendas. It's a bit more cumbersome, but it can be achieved as follows. The revised agenda must be posted at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting, and it must be posted at two public locations. So what we take from that is school committees cannot amend their agendas at the very meeting. It must be filed electronically with the Secretary of State, and it must be posted on the school district's website. Uh, as part of a legislative session quite a few years ago, there was that significant amendment which struck the provision that required school committees to publish notice in a newspaper of general circulation. This section of the act is, has not been struck, but its applicability is very much in question at this point. Continuing with amending school committee agendas, there must be a formal process available to provide timely notice of the revised agenda to any person who has requested it, and that the school district has taken reasonable steps to make the public aware of this process. The original published notice must indicate that changes will be posted on the website along with two public locations and filed electronically with the Secretary of State. So one of the other areas where the Open Meeting Act differs depending on where, uh, depending on what public body you are is public comment. In this respect, it differs very, um, very small, very minutely. Um, public comment. Public bodies can respond to matters that the public brings up during public comment, even if those matters are not on the agenda. You don't have to amend the agenda. Um, the public, during a, pu during a public notice, uh, sorry, during a noticed uh, public comment uh, period, can bring up any matter that they want during that public comment, and the public body can respond. That does not violate the Open Meetings Act. Um, this is for comments that are initiated by the public. 
not by the public body. This does not allow the public body or members of the public body to initiate or bring up matters that are not on the agenda. If the public body wants to do that, or if members of the public body want to do that, they have a couple options. They can either put it on the agenda, um, they can amend the agenda subject to everything that Lisa just talked about right now. So there are ways for members of the public to get things um, on the agenda or talk about them at a public meeting even if they're not initiated, but this is not one of them. This is only for members of the public and then members of the public body responding to that. We get a bunch of complaints every year also from uh, citizens that a public body either limited their public comment or eliminated public comment or something along that line. Uh, the Act, I'm sorry, the Open Meeting Act does not govern those situations. The Open Meeting Act expressly says that nothing requires a public body to hold an open forum session to entertain or respond to any topic, nor does it prohibit any public body from limiting comments. So you don't have to have an open comment. I recognize that a lot of public bodies do so, um, but if you're gonna have that public comment, just make sure that uh, you're following this and not initiating your own comments. Um, if you're a school committee, the only difference here really is that under the, uh, access, I'm sorry, under the Open Meeting Act, the request to speak by the member of the public has to be submitted in writing. That's really the only difference. Again, for informational purposes only, um, for both school committees and non-school committees, matters brought up during public comment cannot be voted upon. They can only be discussed. What do your minutes have to include? Um, it's actually pretty bare boned. Your minutes have to include the date, time, and place of the meeting, the members who are present or absent at a meeting, any votes that are taken at the meeting by individual member, how they voted, um, and any other relevant information that a member of the public body requests to be included in the minutes, okay? The, the voting, if it's a unanimous vote, you can just indicate unanimous. That indicates how everybody voted. With respect to the last clause about any other information that a member of the public body wants to be included, please note that's that the public body wants to be included or members of the public body want to be included, not members of the public. You certainly can include what members of the public want included. There's just no requirement under the Open Meeting Act that you do so. Where members of public bodies want certain things included in the minutes, we've held that they have to state so very specifically that they're invoking 42-46-7A. Uh, okay, just saying I want this in the minutes doesn't expressly invoke that provision. So make sure you do it. If you want something included, make sure you expressly uh, invoke that provision. Um, otherwise, and I recognize a lot of the minutes are much more detailed than what's included, but that's what is required to be included in your minutes. <coughs> Disclosing your minutes. Um, let's start with that there's two different types of minutes. There's official minutes and unofficial minutes. Official minutes are those minutes that are approved by your public body. Unofficial minutes are obviously the minutes that have not been approved. Those minutes have to be disclosed. Now, when they have to be disclosed, where they're disclosed, at least for the unofficial minutes, depends on what public body you are. Uh, you see that it, this slide says all, it's applicable to all with an asterisk, that means it's really not all. Um, but everybody is gonna fall within this category except for those that don't. Uh, everybody's gonna fall. <laughs> it's that hard hitting legal analysis that you get here at the AG Summit. Um, Everybody, this is gonna be uh, everybody except for fire entities. We'll talk about the fire entities in a second. But everybody else, your unofficial minutes have to be made available within 35 days of the meeting or prior to the next regularly scheduled meeting, whichever is earlier. Okay, so 35 days before the next regularly scheduled meeting, whichever is earlier, and it has to be made available at the office of the public body. Okay? Uh, the exceptions for sealed executive session minutes and you can extend the time for filing your minutes, your unofficial minutes, or for making your unofficial minutes available at the office of the public body, as long as you state so publicly and you do so and you extend that in open session. So that's the rule for everybody except for fire entities. Fire entities, and just to be clear, the definition of that is all volunteer fire companies, associations, fire district companies, or any other organization currently engaged in the mission of extinguishing fires and preventing fire hazards, your time frame is within 21 days of the meeting, but no later than seven days prior to the, regularly, to the next regularly scheduled meeting, whichever is earlier, 
And as opposed to putting, uh, making your minutes available on, uh, at the office of the public body, your minutes, your unofficial minutes have to be made available on the Secretary of State's website. Okay, so a much different uh, time frame, different uh, requirement as, where, as to where those are located. Um, you'll also see that there's no extension. Okay, so when you're, if you're in that category of fire entities, you can't extend the time um, to make your unofficial minutes available. Um, with respect to official minutes, this also used to be depending on who you were. Um, it was amended, I think, a year ago. And now everybody, including fire entities, are all in the same boat. Makes it pretty straightforward. Everybody has to make their official minutes available um, on the Secretary of State's website within 35 days of a meeting, the exception being for advisory bodies only. You can't extend the time period. Your official minutes have to be made available within 35 days of a meeting um, on the Secretary of State's website. That's applicable to everybody, state, municipality, fire districts, everybody. Um, we get the question, and uh, you know, to be perfectly blunt, I hate getting questions that I can't answer, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, what do you do if you don't have a meeting within 35 days to approve the minutes? Um, like I said, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, that was something we brought up during the legislation. The Attorney General wrote a letter and said, you know, that's well and good for public bodies that meet within that 35-day time frame, but what about public bodies that don't meet every 35 days? You're requiring the official minutes to be posted with the Secretary of State's office. You don't even have a meeting to approve those types of minutes. It does pose an issue. Um, you know, hopefully it's something that does get addressed uh, through the legislative process. All of your open meetings must be accessible to persons with disabilities. So if your meeting is not on the ground floor, you must have a working elevator. We had a finding a few years back where the city held its meetings in a very old building with a small elevator, which could not accommodate most wheelchairs. They did have a platform lift to go up the stairs, but the complainant felt that it was very slow and unsafe. After a complaint was filed with our office, the city agreed to accept bids to modify the elevator to ensure compliance with the Open Meetings Act, and in the interim, agreed to hold meetings in an alternative place that was in compliance. Now, emergency meetings. Upon a majority vote, an emergency meeting may, may be convened to address an unexpected occurrence that requires immediate action to protect the public. But if an emergency meeting is going to be called, there are some procedural requirements that must be met. The agenda shall be posted as soon as practicable, and it shall be posted on the Secretary of State's website and at the meeting. The public body shall state for the record why the matter had to be addressed in less than 48 hours, and it shall only discuss the issue which created the need for the emergency. So this provision should be and is rarely implemented. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, findings where we agreed with the public body that an emergency meeting was appropriate. There was one where a town sent letters to firefighter recruits advising them to appear for work the following week when the money had not been appropriated for their hiring. So we determined that was an emergency. We've seen a case where there was a large amount of snow on a school roof. It was in danger of collapsing. So the school committee had to convene on less than 48 hours. So that was an emergency. Now, any citizen or entity of the state who is aggrieved as a result of any violation of the Open Meetings Act may file a complaint with the Department of Attorney General. In the Fernandez case, the complaint alleged that the Foster Volunteer Fire Center violated the act by failing to post su sufficient notice and failing to timely post meeting minutes. But the complaint provided no indication that these alleged defects specifically disadvantaged him. Instead, he only provided conclusory assertions. And we held that because these bare assertions of interest are insufficient to demonstrate aggrieved status, 
we found that the complaint did not meet his burden and had no standing. In the Langseth finding, there the complaint alleged that the Commerce Corporation violated the act when it untimely posted minutes on the Secretary of State's website for some meetings. But the complaint, again, provided no indication that he was aggrieved during the time period when the meeting minutes should have been posted, but were not. In fact, the complaint informed our department that he did not have any specific interest in any of the meetings. <laughs> As such, the complaint had no standing to object and we found no violation. Very similar in uh, Novak. A citizen can also file a lawsuit in superior court. And a court, as a remedy, may order injunctive relief and declare any actions taken by the public body to be null and void, and may impose a civil fine of up to $5,000 for a willful and knowing violation, and may award attorney's fees and costs. So that completes the open meeting portion. Um, we're going to go right into questions and answers. Um, we know that we've got some that have been submitted. Um, Joe, I think you've already probably activated the, the microphones that will walk around the classroom. If you, have a, if you have a question, please wait for the person to get to you. Otherwise, the people in the other room can't hear the question. Uh, so with that, Lisa, do you have questions or you raise your hand? I'll start with a question that I've gotten that's been submitted. Let me start with this and then Karen, you can go over there. The, the microphone should already be on. Um, so this regards, we get a lot of questions regarding um, requests for access to public records. This was a question where a request was made um, for the public body to provide all laws that pertain to a particular crime or issue. Um, not surprisingly, as I read a little bit further down on the request, the request was made by an ACI prisoner um, regarding legal advice. So, you know, the question then really hones into, okay, there was a request made um, to the Department of Corrections for all laws that pertain to a certain crime. Please provide me all documents that relate to this. Um, to me, this reminds me of a decision that was issued many years ago by Judge Hurst in the Superior Court, uh, Blaze versus Revens. And what Judge Hurst said in that case was the Access to Public Record Act requires public bodies These to questions. provide access to documents. It doesn't require public bodies or members of public bodies to be research assistants, or in this case, legal assistants. Um, so th this type of, of question, to me, I think implicates that interest, where you're asking somebody not to um, make the cold, hard, factual determinations of whether a document is responsive, but to do the legal research concerning um, whether you know, all laws pertaining to a particular crime. Um, I mean, quite frankly, if, if that were a public record, then I think I could probably start to submit access to public record questions regarding legal issues to public bodies and just uh, sit back and have everybody else do my, my research, which <laughs> sounds, sounds interesting to me. Um my question is, is a public body required to keep paper copies of meeting agendas, meeting minutes, and all backup materials for agenda items on file indefinitely? So the Open Meeting Act expressly says, I'm trying to remember if it's the Open Meeting or Public Record, I think it's the Open Meeting Act expressly says that notices for your meetings have to be kept for one year. So that's, that's a requirement under the Open Meetings Act. The rest of your question about maintaining minutes, maintaining backup for minutes and meetings, really is a um, retention schedule question. Um, the access to public record nor the Open Meeting Act really governs that part of it. I, I would check what your town or, or state agency retention schedule is. Um, they may very well require an indefinite um, retention, but, but that's the answer, not the access or open meeting. So it's uh, the town that decides. It's your town retention schedule. It's probably your town retention schedule. Go ahead, Lisa. Can open meetings be held in secure buildings that require being granted access via a buzzer or an intercom, given that someone is stationed to allow access during the entirety of the meeting? So yes, that, that would be allowed. There are numerous secured buildings 
and you can't have an uh, open meeting in such a building. Any other questions? Right there, Karen, there's a couple. I think I know the answer, but just to clarify it because it just came up. The exception that correspondence of or to an elected official is an exemption. If correspondence comes to four of a seven member body, that exemption no longer applies because you're not sending that correspondence to an official, you are now sending that correspondence to the body. Is that true or no? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I think I'd, I'd really like to see what the correspondence actually says. Okay. Um, my gut inclination is that you're seeking to, to draw some distinction that, you know, it's addressed to the Barrington Town Council versus listing four members um, uh, on the letterhead of the Barrington Town Council. You know, whether it's one member of the Barrington Town Council, and I'm just making up Barrington, obviously. Um, what's that? Um, it, it, whether it's one member of Barrington or four members, I don't know that that is, is distinguishable for, for Exemption M. Um, you know, whether members and their names is distinguishable from the Barrington Town Council, um, you know, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is. I, I haven't seen that question. Um, I'm not sure there's a distinction, at least in that exact, in, in that situation. I've always thought, you know, from the Department of Attorney General, for instance, a letter that's just addressed to the Department of Attorney General, but not to the Attorney General, that there's a distinction there. But I think with the town council, you may be in a little bit of a different situation, but I'm not really sure. So we'd have to Yeah, so, so, and I guess that's a great point to, to just bring up. I mean, the questions that Lisa and I are going to answer are those that are either answered by some of our findings or a court case or the plain language of the statute. Um, as I've well demonstrated, there's certainly areas where we can't answer or I can't answer that, that question. Um, in those types of situations, you all have legal counsel if you're part of a public body. Ask your legal counsel. Um, we have a process at the AG's office that if your legal counsel wants to, in their discretion, they can ask us for a written or an oral advisory opinion. They typically know that process very well. Um, they can contact us if, if they're not familiar, and we can address it through that avenue. Thank you. You're welcome. Rachel. Uh, is it should be on. Is it, is it on? Yep. Okay, I can't. Uh, do investigatory records of public bodies ever become public? Um, and the reason I ask that question I think sort of goes to the balancing test question. Sometimes the only way to determine whether or not a public body is living up to its enforcement responsibilities is to look at whether or not it is seriously investigating things. So let me just repeat the question because now I'm not sure that the microphone is on based on the lack of, um, but, but the question really was, whether investigatory records of public bodies ever become public, um, kind of to ensure that there's a check against the investigation of the agency. Uh, and the answer is, is quite frankly, no. Um, you know, as the law is written right now, if a document is exempt under P, because it's an investigatory record, those records are exempt. There's no sunset provision or there's nothing like that that says once the investigation is complete, all records are public. What it does say is that uh, the final agency action is public. Um, so that is public right now, and right now under existing law, but all the other backup and all the other investigatory documents under <coughs> existing law are not. And, and it really brings up the, uh, an additional point. Um, you mentioned the balancing test. Once a document falls within the exception, it doesn't, it's not subject to the balancing test to take it out of the exception. So in other words, if it's exempt under exemption P or any other exemption, it's exempt from disclosure. And again, it doesn't mean that government can't give it out, it just means government doesn't have to give it out. But there is no such thing as it's exempt from disclosure and now we do the balancing test to determine whether the public interest outweighs the exemption or outweighs the privacy interest and then it becomes public. 
That's not the equation under the Access to Public Records Act. If it's exempt, it's exempt, and that's the end of it. Okay. Two quick questions. Did I understand correctly on votes that if it's not unanimous that the record of the vote has to include the names of the people in the affirmative and the negative? Correct. Okay. Also, regarding uh, detail on agendas, is it sufficient to say discussion and or action uh, and then list the items for discussion? Or do you need to go into more detail on each individual item? Repeat that one more time, if you don't mind. Is it sufficient under the, on the agenda to say discussion uh, discussion and or action on the following items to include a possible vote? Uh, is that sufficient? That should be sufficient. Okay. Uh, and and we've, we've said that that is sufficient. Um, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just automatically through a boilerplate be saying that, but if you believe that there's any possibility that there's going to be action, you know, as we've stated, more notices is better. And if you just say discussion, you're going to be, you're going to be limited to just discussion. And no matter what public body you are, you can't amend the agenda to include an action item. Thank you. And quickly, executive session minutes. Who, who has access to them? Does a committee chair have access to previous executive session minutes? Yeah, you know, that's not really governed by the Open Meetings Act. Um, it doesn't really talk about who has access to executive session minutes. It doesn't talk about executive session minutes expiring or becoming public at some point. Um, so I think that that's really a question that's best left to the individual towns or, or bodies. Thank you. Okay. Lisa, do you have questions? Yes. Uh, this question comes from a college student. I am currently in the process of writing a case study about a dispute that took place between two jurisdictions. Over the course of the dispute, the councils for the two jurisdictions met in, on several occasions in executive session. The dispute has since been resolved but the executive session records remain sealed. Is there any possibility of having the documents unsealed? And if so, what would the procedure be? This is strictly for educational research purposes only. Um, I think, as we indicated, the executive session minutes, if you choose to seal them, uh, are, remain sealed. As Mike indicated, there's no sunset provision. I think what you could do is reach out to the two jurisdictions, explain what you're doing, see if they'll unseal them, maybe just temporarily, um, but it's up to them. If they choose that they don't want to do that, there's, uh, they remain sealed. Go ahead, Karen. Um, my question regards uh, public comment. Um, if a member of the public who cannot attend a meeting submits a comment on an agenda item or whatever else via email um, to the chairperson of the commission, um, how, how is that considered in terms of public comment and does it have to be uh, read publicly at the meeting? Yeah, I don't think there's any requirement under the Open Meetings Act that it has to be read. Um, you know, go back to the provision that I had talked about a couple moments ago, uh, that under the, Act, under the Open Meetings Act, there's no requirement to even have a public comment or to limit public comment. So the way the law is written right now, uh, I, I don't think that there's any requirement that it, that it be read. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be, doesn't mean it doesn't have to be, but I mean, if you're asking me about a mandate that it has to be read, I think the answer is no. Um, I've got a question. I love when the first sentence just glares out to me, politics. Um, uh, the, when the Democratic, and this is, I'm reading it as written, just to be clear to everybody. Um, when the Democratic majority in the Rhode Island House of Representatives, and then it says in parentheses, or Senate, meets in closed caucus for a reason not exempted under the open meeting law to discuss pending legislation, why is this not a violation of the Open Meetings Act? 
Well, it really depends on what the subject matter of the discussion is. Um, but to answer the question, on page 30, the definition of a public body, um, we talked about how broad it is, but the last sentence of that section says, for purposes of this section, any political party, organization, or unit thereof, meeting or convening, is not and should not be considered to be a public body. And then it goes on, provided, however, that no such meeting shall be used to circumvent the requirements of this chapter. So that's probably the answer right there. Um, you know, it's, I'm not sure exactly what the question factually is talking about, but that's, that may very well be what the answer is. Um, Rachel? Is there any uh, provision in the Open Meetings Act about special meetings um, and requirements of them, whereas like a, a town council might have a monthly meeting that's regularly scheduled at a particular time um, every, every month, but then a special meeting is called. Are there any, and there's no videotape of special meetings, but only of regular meetings. And there will be the 48 hour notices and an agenda, but the public really uh, kind of isn't really informed because it's, it's last minute. And there's no emergency, but it's just a special meeting. Are there, is there any provision on that in the Open Meetings Act? Really, the provisions that, that are there, that are in the Open Meeting Act are those that you just articulated. It's the 48 hour notice, um, you know, one of the, the great things about the Secretary of State's website, as I understand it, um, and hopefully I'm giving you a correct understanding, is that if somebody's interested in a particular public body, I think they can set it up to, to get alerts for that public body. Now you're right, confirm, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, that's a mechanism that I think is, is, is of great use if you're, if you're interested in a particular body. You know, you're still subject to that 48 hours. Um, that's just the way the law is written. You know, obviously that was amended a little bit in the last year concerning weekend hours not counting and holidays not counting. Um, but there's no requirement that it has to be on certain dates or, you know, notice beyond the 48 hours that we've talked about. Right in front. Thank you. On a slide on page 10 about rolling or walking quorums uh, can be created not only by members of a public body but through a third person. I'd like you to elaborate a little more on that because um, you mentioned as an example, Lisa, the uh, town manager talking to council members, I believe. But suppose it was a reporter polling the different members of the council on a particular issue that was before the council. Isn't that allowed? When does that turn into a quorum? Well, so, I mean, when we deal with these walking quorum issues, they get really fact-specific. And I referenced the one we had with Newport before where we're literally, you know, okay, what did you and I talk about? Okay, is that the same, same subject matter that you and somebody else talked about? They get very fact-specific. You know, if there's a reporter, the example that, of, of the third party is where that third party typically is being used as a conduit um, to convey information. So if, let's just say that three's a quorum, if you and I have a discussion and then you talk to the town manager and the town manager conveys, okay, this is what two members said to a third party, you know, then you've really circumvented the Open Meetings Act. That, pers that person's really been used as a conduit more than, you know, let's just take a hypothetical reporter situation where a reporter interviews you and I, this is what I think, and the reporter then goes to a third party, to, to a third member of the, the public body. Well, you know, these two members said this, what's your opinion on that? I see that factually different. You know, I'm not sure that there's a lot of substantive difference, but the intent is different. You're talking about not just a third party, but a third party that's outside the, the public body um, arena. So, you know, th that's kind of the situation. We're, we're looking for some situation, whether inadvertently or not, where the Open Meeting Act has been circumvented. If there are people in the, the satellite rooms, by the way, who want to come in here, there's plenty of room to come in and ask questions or to provide questions in, on paper if they want to. Uh, we've got more people here with questions, but uh, just want to invite other people in, obviously, also. All right, so my question um, is, as a public agency, as part of our procurement process, um, we obviously receive um, proposals from various companies. Um, a lot of times when they submit their proposals, they label them as confidential and proprietary. And then once, um, sorry, did this cut out? Um, once we you know, um, 
make our decision and award, a lot of times we then get requests for those proposal documents from either members of the public, but most often from other companies that bid on the same um, RFP. So my question then becomes is, is the agency um, under the exemption related to you know confidential, commercial, and trade secrets able to accept what those companies are labeling as proprietary and confidential um, so that you know, us as the agency doesn't get into the determination of what a company is considering confidential without understanding the nature of their business. Yeah, you know, I, I don't like to get into labels, but in your situation, the label I would think is relevant. I'm not sure that it's dispositive, but I think it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because under Exemption B, the Rhode Island Supreme Court's issued a couple cases, uh, Convention Center Authority versus Providence Journal or Providence Journal versus Convention Center Authority, and it lays out a test um, by which this type of confidential financial information is public or not public. Mm -hmm. And part of that test is whether the agency or the entity that has provided that information considers it public or would, in the ordinary course of business, make that available to the public. Um, so, you know, I think that how that information is received, I think that that's a relevant consideration, but. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I would hang my hat on that completely. I think I would go through the rest of the analysis. Um, you know, I think it also depends what stage you are in the bidding process. Mm -hmm. I think it also may depend, you know, what those documents say. You know, even after the bidding process, I can see it conceivable that there's still a financial trade secret information as mm -hmm. to what somebody's bid was, if not successful. That affects things down the line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't want to make those broad conclusions mm -hmm. definitively, but I, I think that that's part of what I would look at, and I would definitely direct you to, or legal counsel, mm -hmm. um, to that Providence Journal Convention Center Authority case, because I think that, that that's where the answer is. Okay, thank you. Uh, you had uh, addressed earlier the uh, discrepancy or ambiguity between the requirement uh, for filing on the one hand, uh, unofficial uh, minutes um, within 35 days or the next regular meeting and the requirement that uh, official or approved minutes be filed uh, with the Secretary of State uh, electronically. And you pointed to the dilemma faced by boards that may meet uh, not so frequently. But am I correct that all boards, no matter how, how frequently they meet, must file unofficial minutes within 35 days uh, at, a, at the physical place of the public body. Is, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So that... Within, uh, well, within 35 days or prior within, to the next regularly scheduled meeting, meeting, whichever is earlier. I'm thinking of the situation of a board that's not meeting within 35 days. So, uh, so there's nothing to prevent uh, that board from filing the, the exact same thing at the Secretary of State's website, is there? There's not, but the issue you get into, and those of you that know me, I'm very good at raising issues but not solving them. <laughs> um, and that's what I'm gonna do right now. Um, but the problem that you get into is, it may very well be the same exact document, but you're at the meeting, you know, let's just say it's whatever it is, it's July 1st, you're at the meeting, you obviously don't have minutes of the July 1st meeting because you're right there. And if you don't have minutes, if you don't have a meeting until 35 days after, there's nobody to, you know, you've got a, a, there's nobody to approve them. So you've got your meeting on July 1st, you have somebody type up the, the unofficial minutes on July, whatever it is, 15th. Those are your unofficial minutes. You make them available within 35 days of the meeting but you can't approve those minutes until your next meeting. That's, that's the issue that public bodies run into. So it may very well, it could be the same document, but it has to have that imprimatur of being your official or approved minutes, and that can't happen without having another meeting. Like I said, very good at raising issues, not resolving them. Um, did I answer your question? To the extent that I could? Yeah. <laughs> As long as we're on the same page. Um, other questions? Right here in front, Rachel. Lisa, do you have more questions? Okay. Thank you. Just a couple of things I need a little bit more clarification on. 
If a citizen emails a town council member with an APRA request and that town council member forwards the request on the behalf of the resident to the APRA official or the town clerk, is that an official APRA request? <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, we've spoken on this, and I'm trying to remember exactly what we have said. And um, what I would say to you is, Give me your contact information. I know what the finding is. I just, I, I don't remember exactly what way it comes out. Um, and I don't remember the answer and I don't want to tell you okay. otherwise. Um, can you give any parameters on a time frame of what an advanced written notice is? What happens if it's given after the 48 hours? With respect to the person? Personnel for, for and wanting session? it to be held in an open meeting. So, um, uh, as the question suggests, um, one of the reasons to go into executive session is for to discuss somebody's job performance, character, physical or mental health. And the Open Meeting Act requires that that person who's going to be affected, not just discussed, but affected, it says, ha receives advance written notice. Um, I, I don't think that we've, it, it doesn't have to, I don't think we've specified what that advance written notice has to be. Um, I think it has to be ample notice, and I think it has to be reasonable notice. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think we've said it has to be this. I mean, frankly, to get on the agenda, it has to be 48 hours notice. There has to be at least 48 hours to the public body that that person's going to be discussed um, during the executive session. So any delay after that point, you know, really starts to raise questions with the public body why they didn't provide ample notice. So if it was given just say after the 48 hours and it was on the agenda as an executive session item, and after the 48 hours, the person to be discussed decided, oh, by the way, I want it in open session. During the meeting, they could actually add that item as a discussion topic to the open, as part of the open meeting during the meeting. Yeah, what, what I would do, because we have certainly have said that the person who's affected and receives the advance written notice can elect to have it in open session right up, you know, at the meeting. So I think you have to be a little bit careful on your executive session uh, agendas not to say we're going to convene into executive session. And I think probably this is a good practice to get in for any executive session because you don't know for any executive session that you're definitively going in. You may have a pretty good idea, but you don't know until you take the vote um, to, to indicate that your agenda, uh, to, to indicate on your agenda that you will seek to go into executive session or move to go into executive session rather than saying definitively. There was a superior court decision that said exactly that um, many years ago. Sorry, just a few more. You had made a reference to an exhibit as part of an agenda. Is there any requirement for the backup f materials for an agenda to be posted on the Secretary of State's website? I don't know of a requirement. Um, you know, that really gets into how specific and how much fair notice do you have to give under the cases we talked about. Um, you know, more notice is obviously better, but I don't know that, I think it's very possible that your agenda could be sufficient based on the language you put on the agenda as opposed to the attachments. Before you get to other questions, just, just a couple minutes remaining, let me see if there are any other questions. There's at least one question right here. Why don't we get to some of the questions and we're, Lisa and I are happy to stay afterwards. We'll answer questions for everybody that you know, still has questions, but I want to give everybody an opportunity to, to at least ask one question if they want to. And we'll probably just have time just for these one or two right here. Go ahead, please. One quick question. So if an, if an APRA request was submitted for an item that really didn't need to be put on an APRA request, um, once it's put on an APRA request, you have to follow it through as if... Yeah, you I know, mean, if once you, it's done, it's done. I mean, it really didn't have to be. It wasn't an item that needed to be put on an APRA request. But once it was put on it, I just thought at that point you would handle it as if it was. I, I, that's what I would do. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of made a little bit of a joke, but I'm sort of serious about it, too. Once you get that APRA request, I would respond to it within 10 business days with some sort of response. You know, putting it aside and just saying this is not an APRA request, you're going to put yourself and your agency in jeopardy. Um, I, I, it would be much preferable just to respond to it and provide whatever response there is within right, that 10 business day period. Some of the items coming through, it's not, it's not even necessary to put them on, public on the APRA request, but once it's done, it's done. 
they, they've invoked it, and, and you should follow the process through. Thank you. All right, let's just do the last question right here. Uh, yes, I'm just wondering, um, if you have minutes and, and there is a tape recorder running and then the secretary does the minutes from the tape recorder or as she's there also, are you required to keep that tape or is that tape just for her use and you submit the minutes as you're supposed to and the minutes stand by themselves just fine? I wouldn't say that the tape is just for internal use only because I think Lisa talked about a finding that we had where the, the tape was maintained and we said it was a public record. As to the question of whether or not the tape has to be maintained, that's, the that, that's, that's a retention schedule question. That's not an access to, access to public record or open meeting question. There's nothing under either of those laws that requires the tape to be maintained, but there might be provisions under the retention schedule policies that require it to at be maintained. At your town hall, you're saying? Exactly. So at that same town hall, then, um, we have a unique situation, so you shouldn't be spending too much time on it. But if that same town hall, when you go to submit your minutes, tells you they don't want them, that they should only go to the Secretary of State, um, you were also already said that they should go to the public body, um, but they don't want them, is what I was told, or that they, I don't need to submit them, they're not taking them. Um, maybe that's a private conversation we need to have. I was just gonna say, you confused me a little bit. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about it afterwards. And we okay, can, thank you, so. appreciate it. Let that. me thank everybody for attending once again. Um, if you're an attorney, make sure you get your CLE credits, your, your certificates, and thank you very much.